Um, I want to start by mentioning my colleague, my friend, Evan Gershkovich, who has been in a Russian prison for 258 days, wrongfully detained on bogus charges for doing his job. We obviously are advocating and calling for his immediate release, but can you update us on what the US government has been doing also to see if they can secure his release? Uh, absolutely, and I actually just saw a number of your colleagues yesterday who are um, working very hard to secure his release and came into my office in the West Wing to get an update. Um, as you said, Evan is being unjustly detained uh, for doing his job as a reporter, and this is about him as an individual who deserves to be free and home with his family, but it's also about the principle of press freedom. And so this is a top priority for President Biden, who just recently spoke, uh, spoke out on Evan a few days ago um, and continues to direct us to take every step we possibly can to get him out. We have been engaged at senior levels with the Russian government. Um, trying to work some kind of negotiation or understanding that would lead to his release. And I will be very careful about the details of that because the best way to get him home is to keep those negotiations sensitive. But I will say that to date, we have not been able to come up with an arrangement that works for the Russian government to actually produce Evan and produce Paul Whelan, who's another American who's been unjustly detained for a very long time. But it's something that we will keep at from the very highest levels uh, in terms of direct lines into the Kremlin uh, and into other organs of the Russian government uh, as we try to work a formula uh, that can get Evan out and bring him home. And I can tell you, um, look you in the eye and tell you that this is something that I'm personally engaged on, other members of the president's national security team and the president himself, and we're not gonna rest until we succeed in bringing him home. We certainly can't wait to have him home. Um, and obviously, Evan's story is just one small element of this broader, uh, the broader tensions with Russia vis-a-vis -vis its conflict in Ukraine. President Zelensky is here today, and we're very grateful that you were able to make the time to be here with us um, with that busy schedule. Congress has not yet agreed on a supplemental that would, in part, provide funding to provide more weapons for Ukraine. And we're now just three days away from winter recess. The Pentagon has warned that without that funding, um, Ukraine can essentially run out of the security assistance that's been so vital for it to hold its, its lines. And so what does that look like in your mind if that aid runs out? And uh, you know, President Biden has called it, uh, called failure to pass it a victory for Putin. But can you spell it out a little bit in terms of what it actually looks like in your mind? Is it a loss of territory, a frozen conflict, et cetera? Well, look, if the United States is no longer able to muster the resources to send weapons, critical weapon systems to Ukraine, um, at the, and that will happen at the end of December. So starting in January, we will no longer have the funding to be able to send weapons to Ukraine and then replenish them for our own stocks. It will mean a very specific deterioration in Ukraine's <laughs> capabilities to both hold territory and take territory, as well as to defend Ukrainian cities against an aerial assault by Russia. So for example, uh, we have been steadily sending them 155 artillery ammunition so that they can both make progress on the battlefield and defend against relentless Russian assaults in the east that have been ongoing for several weeks and the Ukrainians have stood up in a stalwart way against those. We will no longer be able to send them air defense interceptors so that um, they will begin to dwindle their supply of the, Frank, the bullets in the Patriot and other systems that they use to shoot Russian missiles out of the sky. And as time goes on, um, that will only have a compounding effect on their uh, capacity on the battlefield. And that's why President Putin himself, you don't have to take it from us, has said that you know basically if the US and the West cut off Ukraine from military assistance, Ukraine will have, quote, one week to live. That was his phrase. Now that's a boast, it's a taunt. It's not quite like that, but it tells you an underlying reality that Ukraine has, succeeded so far in resisting Russian domination because of the bravery of the Ukrainian forces and the resilience of the Ukrainian people, but also because of the dramatic military assistance that has been provided by the United States and our Western allies. And if that is no longer forthcoming, it will have a significant effect on Ukraine's capacity to hold territory, let alone to take territory back from the Russians. So do you think that a 2024 counteroffensive is essentially impossible without this aid? Well, I believe that um, without this aid, we simply will not be able to get them the amount of artillery ammunition and other forms 
of ammunition and weapon systems for them to have the kind of battlefield progress that we have seen over the course of the past 18 months. Over the course of the past 18 months, Ukraine has taken back 50 percent of the territory that Russia took from them. And while it's true that this counteroffensive didn't make as much progress as Ukraine had hoped, uh, even this counteroffensive took a significant amount of territory. And uh, we believe that if we do get the assistance, Ukraine will be set up to continue to put pressure on Russian lines, as well as be able to hold up against any possibility that Russia takes substantially more territory itself. So I think 2024 would be a very difficult year if we were not able to get the assistance to Ukraine. And what's remarkable about it is this is a choice we can make. You know, this is not some event in the world or something where um, the ultimate outcome is beyond our control. It is entirely within our control to continue to support Ukraine, to continue to rally the international coalition to support Ukraine. And if you think about where we were in February of 2022, I would venture to guess that very few people in this room or on this stage would have given Ukraine more than a month or a couple of months to live because the expectation was that Russia was going to be able to roll into Kyiv, subjugate and dominate this country, potentially erase Ukraine from the map, erase the idea of being Ukrainian from the history books, which was Putin's objective at the beginning, and Ukraine denied him that objective. Ukraine stands as a proud, free, viable nation that still needs to take more territory back, but has already succeeded in thwarting Russia's imperial ambitions. And for us to walk away now, I mean, it would be a remarkable strategic own goal for us. And President Biden is determined to do everything in his power to rally the bipartisan support. And there is genuine bipartisan support to get the votes uh, to get Ukraine the aid that it needs next year. There is bipartisan support, but um, this supplemental could be <coughs> held up by a group of GOP holdouts for, for the most part. But I want to ask you, because an AP poll released just last month found that nearly half of Americans think that the U.S. is spending too much on Ukraine. And so to play devil's advocate here, do you think there's onus on the administration for successfully conveying to the American people the need, the national security imperative of continuing to assist Ukraine, because ultimately what they believe will influence, you know, they're the constituents that will influence their lawmakers. So yes, I, I think it is our responsibility to make the case and, and to continue to try to be as clear and convincing to the American people as possible. Uh, I also believe there is still a strong reservoir of support among the American people for Ukraine and a strong reservoir of support for the idea of the United standing up for freedom, democracy, sovereignty, and so forth. But the real issue here, Vivian, is not if you polled individually the members of the House and the Senate and said, are you for continuing to support Ukraine or not? You'd have a, a strong bipartisan majority in both in the House and the Senate who'd say yes to that. The real issue is, so it's not really about making that case. The real issue is that it's being held hostage to a totally separate issue, which is the southwest border. Now, President Biden has said that he's prepared and has um, supported negotiations for a bipartisan agreement around the southwest border. But President Biden has also said that the administration is not prepared to just accept a take-it-or-leave-it demand while Ukraine aid is being held hostage. And so that's the real issue we are confronting here. And from my perspective, we do have to work through border policy and border resources, and the President has said he's prepared to do that. But at the end of the day, the United States cannot walk away from Ukraine. And I believe that based on the performance of Ukraine on the battlefield, based on the results of the aid we've given so far, a strong majority of members, Democrat and Republican in the House, recognize that at some level, and it's a matter of getting over this linkage issue or finding a resolution on the border that is the central stumbling block to actually producing the aid that Ukraine needs. It's quite extraordinary that uh, essentially President Biden's uh, foreign policy legacy right now is being tied to this domestic issue or, you know, the border issue that um, you know, multiple administrations have tried and struggled to address. Well, it has been a very long time uh, since a substantial immigration reform package has passed. It's been multiple administrations, multiple efforts. And President Biden, on the very first day he was in office, sent the Hill a comprehensive immigration reform package on day one of January 20th, 2021. So uh, it is remarkable in a sense. But I think the key thing here from President Biden's perspective and mine is 
this is less about legacy. It's more about the reality of the international order, of the stability of Europe, of the freedom of the Ukrainian people, and of making sure that Vladimir Putin does not prevail in this conflict. And that is what is at stake right now uh, as President Zelensky is here in town. I had the chance to sit with President Zelensky last night uh, for a long private conversation. He will see the president today. Uh, he and the president will stand up together to speak to the American people and to the world. And President Zelensky, of course, this morning is on his way to the Hill to make the case there for why it's so important that he get this assistance. He must be, is he worried? Uh, is he, did, has he arrived here and expressed some well, concern to you? Well, keep in mind, this is a guy who was watching columns of tanks roll down the road from Belarus towards Kyiv, and that is not a very long distance, who stood out uh, in the street outside the presidential palace on the first night of the war and said, I'm here and I'm staying here. So he's someone who has seen a lot uh, of challenges over the course of the past 18 months is and, re and has remained optimistic and stalwart in the face of that. And that spirit is still very much present. Uh, and I think that is what you will see reflected today. We, we could stay the entire session on this, but um, of course there are other challenges in the world. Um, you are heading to Israel this week. Um, as part of this nearly weekly shuttle diplomacy effort that the Biden administration has launched since October 7th. On Sunday, Secretary of State um, Antony Blinken told CNN's Jake Tapper that right now, quote, the critical thing is to make sure the military operations are designed around civilian protection and to focus on that. The UN, the WHO, and other international organizations have warned that civilians continue to pay the price for this war at an extraordinary rate, with the death toll crossing 17,000 this week, the vast majority of them civilians. Um, and Gaza is becoming virtually unlivable, according to the head of the UN Relief Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. And so there appears to be a disconnect between the public messaging that the Biden administration has been um, sharing about their conversations with Israel and what we're actually seeing play out across Gaza. And so can you explain exactly what is happening there? Well, to understand what's happening there, you have to start with the basic reality that Israel's confronting. On October 7th, um, we saw the worst massacre of the Jewish people since the Holocaust, perpetrated by savage, brutal terrorists who came out of Gaza into Israel and slaughtered people in their beds, men, women, children, conducted unspeakable acts, including uh, crimes of sexual violence that are you know, almost difficult to fathom. They then went back into Gaza, embedded themselves among the civilian population, including in and around hospitals and other civilian institutions. Um, put their rocket emplacements to continue firing at Israel, and basically treated the Palestinian population of Gaza as human shields. So that's the military reality. And then said, basically, um, how about a ceasefire? Essentially, let's go slaughter you, then go hide behind a bunch of civilians and call a ceasefire. There was a ceasefire. There was a ceasefire on October 6th that both sides were abiding by. That ceasefire was broken by Hamas. Then, after several weeks, Israel and Hamas reached a pause in order to enable the release of 100-plus hostages um, with the support and facilitation of the United States, as well as Qatar and Egypt. Uh, Israel was prepared to continue that pause so that hostages could continue to come out. But Hamas said, we are not going to release some of the women, the younger women that we are holding, uh, and thereby made the choice to end the hostage deal and, um, and have the fighting resume. That's on Hamas, and Hamas to this day continues to hold women, um, elderly people, civilians, in significant numbers, and yet still is saying, hey, how about everybody just stop? So we believe that Israel has the right to defend itself, has the right to go after the terrorists, and they have an added responsibility compared to almost any modern military because they are contending with a terrorist group that does not care one bit about the civilian population and, as I said, treats them as human shields. But that added responsibility does not lessen their burden to have to comply with international humanitarian law, to separate terrorist targets from innocent civilians, and to take every measure they can to protect civilians. And we will continue to assert that. We have said that as a matter of principle from the beginning. 
We have had very intensive private conversations with the Israelis about this issue and will continue to do so. And you've heard from Secretary Blinken, you've heard from me, from the President, from others, that every innocent death is a tragedy, whether it's Palestinian or Israeli or anyone. And we have to mourn for that and we have to work as hard as we can to prevent that from happening. And equally, we have to work as hard as we can to get aid into the people of Gaza so that they have access to life-saving food, medicine, water, sanitation. And the United States, more than any other country, has created the possibility for aid to flow in, and we are going to continue to press upon that in the days ahead. Um, but that is the difficulty that we're confronting. It does not lessen Israel's responsibility, but it does show you the challenge that uh, exists in the context of this conflict and will continue to exist, and we will continue to stand up strongly for our values and principles, even as we support Israel's right to defend itself. We've reported that the Biden administration has urged Israeli officials to wrap this war up in weeks, not months. Um, is that a message that you will continue to share when you travel to Israel? And also, how realistic is that, particularly if no additional hostages are released? Well, I will certainly be talking to Prime Minister Netanyahu, the War Cabinet, and the senior national security leadership of Israel about timetables, about how they are thinking about that. I'm not going to characterize it the way that you just have um, or sort of lay out in public what the message I'll be carrying from the president is, but the subject of how they are seeing the timetable of this war will certainly be on the agenda for my meetings. And I prefer to keep that conversation behind closed doors. I also believe that high intensity military operations of the kind we have seen over the past several weeks, um, it doesn't have to be that you go from that to literally nothing in terms of putting pressure on going after Hamas targets, Hamas leadership, or continuing to have tools in your uh, toolbox to try to secure the release of hostages. It just means that you'd move to a different phase from the kind of high intensity operations that we see today. The US is currently having um, discussions with allies and particularly those in the region about post, what the post-Gaza outlook is, um, governance, security, et cetera. Um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu last week said that the military would have to, the IDF would have to retain open-ended security control of Gaza Strip as long as Hamas um, until at, long after the war um, is over and Hamas is defeated. Do you endorse that idea? Well, we've been clear that we believe that reoccupation of Gaza is a bad idea. It should not happen. We believe that the Israeli government ultimately understands that as well. We also believe there will have to be some kind of interim security arrangement as we work on a long-term political solution for both Gaza and the West Bank. And we believe that Gaza and the West Bank have to be connected from a political perspective under a revamped and revitalized Palestinian Authority. So those are the elements that we see as necessary to generate a, a positive resolution uh, to the current crisis, the current conflict, and a more sustainable future for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Um, I will have the opportunity to talk to Prime Minister Netanyahu about what exactly he has in mind with that comment, uh, because that can be interpreted in a number of different ways. But the US position on this is clear. Do you have any um, willingness from Arab allies in the region that they would perhaps participate in some multinational force? Because officials I've spoken to seem very reluctant. I certainly can't sit here and make any announcements of contributions from Arab countries at this time. But there's a basic reality, which is that there will have to be an interim security force solution. And we will work with Arab allies, but also with the entire international community on how that can be sourced and resourced. Um, and quickly, because I do want to um, touch upon a couple other topics before we wrap. You, you talked about the Palestinian Authority, who are vastly unpopular, even in the West Bank, let alone in Gaza. Um, we're, we're, it's hard to envision today uh, a, a Palestinian authority that could handle this challenge, just given uh, years of institutional collapse, corruption, et cetera. And so I wonder, you know, how do you see that realistically playing out? And would the U.S. support elections at some point in Gaza, or does that you know, pose a risk of Hamas coming back into power? Look, I, I, I can't speak to a hypothetical of elections down the road because we're a long way from here to that possibility. But what I will also say is, um, you know, the premise of your question was it's hard to envision what a revamped and revitalized Palestinian Authority could look like that could reflect the will and, 
and have the confidence of the Palestinian people. A lot of things are hard to envision right now when it comes to uh, the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians uh, because we're in the middle of you know, a very acute crisis. But that's always the case when you're in the middle of crises like this. The end game seems hard to envision. But it's really our job to chart out what the basic tent poles of that end game have to look like and then work to build the necessary support and create the context for us to achieve that. So if we kind of sat here and said, what's, what's realistic? It'd be very easy to be cynical and say, ah, not a lot's realistic. People have tried this for decades and we throw up our hands and call it a day. But that is not an available option to us. So we have to drive forward based on what is the only sensible and credible solution here, which is a two-state solution. And with the uh, kind of structures that we are contending with, the Palestinian Authority, which as we have said, should be revamped and revitalized to be able to deal with the challenges in both the West Bank and in Gaza. Um, but what can be hard to imagine today can become reality tomorrow with sufficient political will, effective diplomacy, and frankly, persistence. And that's what we're prepared to bring to bear on this. I do want to talk a little bit about China before we end today. Um, last month, President Biden and uh, Chinese President Xi agreed to restore some military-to-military -military communications between their armed forces when they met on the sidelines of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit in San Francisco. What's the update there? Because our understanding is those military-to-military -military contacts haven't quite started yet. Well, uh, the update is that we believe they're at three different levels, <coughs> we will see the resumption of, <coughs> excuse me, military to military ties. At the leadership level, so between ministries of defense, at the theater commander level, and at the operational level. And, um, you know, you're talking about just a matter of weeks since uh, we had that summit, but clear presidential direction from both President Xi and President Biden to make that happen. And uh, we believe that's on track. And we believe that the real question is not, will it get started? We're confident in that. The real question is, can it be sustained through any ups and downs that may come in the future? Because at previous points of tension between the US and China, China has pulled down all of those military contacts. And we have made the case that those contacts exist not just for the periods of relative stability in the relationship, but precisely for the periods of tension. Because we need to have open lines of communication to be able to avoid mistake, miscalculation, and deal with escalation. So we're hopeful that the fact that President Xi has put his stamp on this at a presidential level will sustain these military-to-military -military contacts out into the future. And that is a central feature of what the Biden approach to the U.S.-China relationship is all about, which is we are in an intense competition, but we need to manage that competition responsibly so it does not veer into conflict. And so we create opportunities where we can work together where our interests converge. And having strong military-to-military -military channels is, frankly, an essential feature of that. So we will work hard to sustain them. But why the delay? I, you, you, know, you, you express such urgency with regard to these communications. And so you would think that they, you know, you'd pick up the phone the next day and get it started. So why, why haven't we seen that? Well, it's not, I mean, it's not literally just pick up the phone. It's right. you know, establishing the parameters and modalities for this. And, and you know, I actually don't think of it as a delay. I think this is just the normal implementation of a summit outcome. And it's continuing as both sides expected it would. So I see no issue there. And we've seen rising tensions all the while between uh, the Philippines and China in the South China Sea, just as the U.S. expanded its enhanced defense cooperation agreement with the Philippines. And so um, do you see this in any way as a response to uh, what the U.S. is trying to do in the Philippines? Do you think China is essentially, uh, essentially exerting its territorial claims? Uh, well, the PRC has um, pursued its territorial claims, which we believe are not or it's, it's broader nine dash line, this kind of notion that all of the South China Sea is, are the waters of China. We do not see that as being rooted in international law or the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And we support the arbitral tribunal, which was a, a UN body that ruled in favor of the Philippines with respect to a lot of these issues. Uh, but China has been pursuing all of that long before the enhanced defense cooperation agreement sites were agreed between the US and the Philippines. Um, that has been um, a persistent pattern of Chinese activity in the South China Sea over many years. Uh, the United States has made clear that we stand for freedom of navigation, lawful unimpeded commerce, and the respect for international law, as well as the respect for this tribunal ruling. And we stand up for uh, 
the Philippines, our ally, being able to uh, carry forward its ability to uh, embrace those principles of freedom of navigation, of operating within its exclusive economic zone without being harassed, and uh, of having its um, a claim to international law be respected and vindicated. We'll stand for that uh, through thick and thin, and we have demonstrated that over the course of the past many months. And it's not just us. There are other countries in the region who have stood up to speak out on behalf of the Philippines here. We have just about 30 seconds left, and I just wanted to squeeze in a question about um, your efforts to diversify supply chains. Um, I know this is something that you're very passionate about. Um, Obviously, export controls have been a major focus of that. How successful do you think, three years into the administration, you have been in uh, being able to offer opportunities should we face another crisis like we did during the COVID years? Well, we've really focused on um, a set of key areas that we think are critical both to economic competitiveness and national security, semiconductors being one, mm -hmm. uh, EV batteries, and the clean energy supply chain being another. And if you just look at this week, we've made our first announcement under the CHIPS Act of, of U.S. government funding going into building out the semiconductor supply chain in the U.S. But even before the provision of that funding, announcements of tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars of investment by Intel, by Samsung, by TSMC in the U.S. to build out chip fabs, that is a sea change from a few years ago. So we are moving, I think, very rapidly and structurally in the direction of greater supply chain resilience in that area. And a similar story can be told in the EV, EV battery space, announcements of major investments in American manufacturing of those batteries across multiple states. So the short answer is uh, this is going to be a long-term project, but it has been a very fast move out of the gates, and we will continue to drive at this as one of the administration's key priorities.